There have been 106 attacks against U.S. forces in Iraq and Syria since September, October 17th, as U.S. forces shoot down 17 Houthi missiles and drones in the Red Sea. Meanwhile, Iran and Hamas are arguing over who takes credit for the October 7th attack on Israel. Joining me now is senior counselor to the Heritage Foundation president and 25-year Army veteran Lieutenant Colonel James Carafano. James, good morning. Hey, good to be with you. So your reaction, obviously seeing our military and our troops under attack continuously in the Middle East is, is one problem and very disconcerting. The other is seeing Hamas and Iran now arguing over who gets credit for October 7th. This has to change U.S. policy towards Iran. We have been giving them a pass for the last three years. That's got to stop, James. Yeah, I was not only in the Army for 25 years, I'm also a military historian. So, look, I've studied wars all through history, and it, war is a competition. And, and when, you're in a, when you're in a competition with an aggressor, and Iran clearly is, and you let them decide when, when, what the next move is, you're always one step behind. And this is a problem with the administration. They have so overinvested in engagement with Iran, and they really don't have a plan B, that they, they, they can't let go of this and they can't do anything else. And so Iran has exploited that, not to start World War III, not to blow up the Middle East, but to, to make immense gains and to embarrass and humiliate the United States at every turn. And what's going to happen is, and, and I pray it doesn't, what I really worry about is, at some point, somebody's going to kill a lot of Americans, like Cobar Towers, and then the Biden administration is going to be forced to respond to that, and that's when things will get really super scary. I hope, James, I hope that that is not the case, but certainly uh, your warning is well heeded. Tiana Lodesher is on set with me. This was quite the about face from Iran, which initially denied being responsible for these attacks and now saying not even just that they were that they were the aggressors because they hate Israel, but specifically in retaliation for the U.S. assassination of Qasem Soleimani. How does this change the calculus for America's allies in the Middle East, including those like Saudi Arabia that is, you know, that have been trying to distance themselves from the Israelis in the aftermath of the October 7th attacks, but are not, but want to diametrically oppose the Iranians? Will this give them a little bit more of a incentive or leeway to uh, allow us to continue to assist the Israelis? So Iran's like a shock, you know, shark in the smelling blood in the water. When they sense weakness, they get more aggressive. Because in the Middle East, remember, honor is power. You're not honorable because you know you don't beat your, you, you you don't beat your wife and you pay taxes. You're honorable because you you show you have power to humiliate your enemies. And so when you when Iran gets away away with stuff. It, to them, it makes them look stronger. And to other countries in the Middle East, it makes us look weaker. Mm. So countries will kind of say, what, you know, what's going on here? And again, it just increases the danger, because in the end, we're never going to desert Israel. We're going to stand up for Israel. If Iran kills a bunch of Americans, we're going to respond to that. So Iran's playing this dangerous game. Do enough to humiliate the United States, make good gains, make our allies worry, but not do enough to start World War III. Well, South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham is calling out the Biden administration for failing U.S. troops in the field following the Navy shooting down ballistic missiles in the Red Sea, James. Obviously, this is an escalation, not a de-escalation in the Red Sea in the region. Uh, what's your reaction? So I would, I would call it an exploitation. But what my real fear is, and the one thing that we're not talking about that we should be, is Iran in the end— they can do a nuclear breakout whenever they want. They're going to they're going to point to the chaos in the Middle East, the wars and everything else and say, "Well, we have to be able to defend ourselves." And we'll say, "We're now a nuclear power because we have to defend ourselves because we can't trust anybody else." And this will be happening to Biden right as he goes into a national election. He'll never look weaker. He, he won't militarily respond against that. And that is, and then Iran will just be a declared nuclear power, and they'll wait to see who gets elected in January and say, hey, we're a nuclear power, live with it. And that's a much, much more dangerous world. It's a very dangerous world, I agree with you. Um, you know, Secretary of State Antony Blinken uh, is expected to travel to the Middle East uh, late next week to discuss the war in Gaza. He has made several trips there. Some say that he's a better leader than, than President Biden's been on this issue. So he's going to visit Israel. 
but he's also going to go to the occupied West Bank, to Jordan, to Saudi Arabia, to the UAE, and to Qatar, James. Uh, what can you expect uh, out of this visit? Is, is his work being effective? overseas right now? Well, about as effective as his visit to Mexico. I, honestly, I think most of it's just, no, really, I think most of it's just public theater. Like, they're making rounds to show we're present. But, but the problem with this administration is that they, they can't pick a side, right? They, they, they can't abandon Israel because it's an absolutely indispensable strategic ally. But, but they don't want to let go of this notion of engaging with Iran and then trying to find a two-state solution. And so it's this, this mealy-mouth middle ground and then that leaves everybody kind of what's going on. It's the same thing in Mexico. We go to Mexico and we pretend that we're working with the Mexicans on securing the border when we know the reason the border is not secure is because of our policies and our refusal to let go of them. So, you know, that, you know his name is so apt. It's, he just blinks, right? He's just there and he's just blinking because they're not really moving the ball forward because they don't really have a plan on how to do that. They're just trying to cope. And if things don't go to hell, then they say, look what a great job we're doing managing things. You know, and, and I, I say my, my reaction to your, your response to my question was because it's so disappointing uh, that this is our diplomacy. This is the best that we can do right now with foreign diplomacy. I mean, he is the Secretary of State. He is, that's who we have in office. We need him to, to be effective and also to, you know, the United States to take an active role, but to be a, a leader around the world. And gosh, I remember back in the day when the United States was a leader on the global scale. And it just seems to me that we have become weak with China, with the Taiwan issue, right. weak on the border, weak when it comes to Iran. Uh, and then even, even going back to the Afghanistan exit, James. Uh, last comment here. Yeah, was, think of it like a poker player, and you're playing with a guy that's the world's worst poker player, and mm. you don't want to crush him. You just want to keep in the game and keep winning. So the good mm. news here is that our enemies may just be trying to eke out as much benefits as they can while he's still in office, and they're not going to escalate to something even more dangerous. Gosh, all right. Well, Lieutenant Colonel James Carafano, uh, it's good to see you. Thank you for being here. Happy New Year, sir. Happy New Year. All right.